So hello, you're very welcome to uh, today's webinar uh, as part of Eden's European Online Distance Learning Week 2020. So we've got a fantastic panel lined up for you today, and our topic is practical and pedagogical ways to assess your students online. I'm Orna Farrell. I'm going to moderate the session with my colleague, Vlad Mihescu. Sorry, Vlad, if I've butchered your name. So please go ahead and say hello in the chat as we're coming in. We're expecting quite a large group this morning, so we might just uh, give everyone a few moments to join uh, and do say hello and tell us where you are. And even better, tell us what the weather is like, because I always like weather information. Um so we have a brilliant panel for you this morning. First of all, we're going to hear from Suzanne Stone and Rob Lowney from Dublin City University, and they're going to share a brilliant resource that they've been involved with the creation of. It's a lovely crowdsourced resource on alternative assessment. And then we have the FAB team from ePortfolio Ireland, a community of practice who obviously like ePortfolio. Tom Farrelly and Karen Buckley will be joining us from ePortfolio Ireland. And then last but not least, James Brunton is going to share his experience of open pedagogy assignments within an online psychology program based in DCU Connected. So fantastic group. I see about 90 attendees in so far. So I'm gonna, gonna crack on now in just one second. Um, rainy Lithuania. Oh, that's disappointing on that now. So during the session, guys, uh, feel free to interact in the chat. If you like, you can also put questions in the Q&A box uh, or questions in the chat. And we will have time at the end to answer and chat about the questions, but also we'll have a brief pause after each presentation uh, to take a few questions. So you should have lots of time to, to ask questions to the panelists and find out a bit more. If there's relevant links or any resources you think would be useful to share, please go ahead and pop them in the chat. Uh, and we'll also do the same with the uh, presenter's slides and any resources that come up as we go along. So without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce Rob and Suzanne from Dublin City University. So Rob Lowney is a learning technologist in the Teaching Enhancement Unit. He works with academic staff to enhance the teaching, learning, assessment practices on their modules with digital technologies. Rob has a particular interest in empowering academic staff to implement technology-enhanced assessment. Other areas he's interested in are flipped learning, mobile devices in education, learning analytics, and reusable learning objects. And then... Suzanne Stone is also a learning technologist in the Teaching Enhancement Unit in Dublin City University. Suzanne has been involved in research relating to educational technologies over a number of years, including projects on a drop-in approach to professional development for Moodle, the development of a vocabulary assessment tool, student engagement in live online classrooms like this, the use of social media applications as back channels. Suzanne holds an MSc in education and training from DCU and is currently engaging in a professional doctorate in digital learning. So over to you, Suzanne and Rob. Thank you very much, Orna and Vlad and all the rest of the team for inviting us here and for that lovely introduction. Uh, as you said, my name is Rob uh, from DCU and my colleague Suzanne is here as well. And we're going to take you through the first uh, presentation here in this webinar. We'll divide it up uh, half and half. So I'll, I'll go first and then I'll hand you over to Suzanne. Um, so first of all, what we'd like to do is give you a, a little bit of, of background to the development of this open an education resource on assessment exemplars and where it came from, where it sprung from. Uh, then we'll take you through the rationale for creating the OER, uh, the process that we used to crowdsource um, the entries in the OER, and then we will round it off by giving you access to the OER itself. So this all kind of started uh, with the Enhancing Digital Teaching and, and Learning project, uh, which is a three-year nationally funded project funded by the Higher Education Authority 
in Ireland and coordinated by the Irish Universities Association, which is the representative body of the seven public Irish universities. Um, and this came to being, I suppose, because uh, as we all know, in, in recent years, there's been a lot of attention given to the need for academic staff to develop digital skills and competences to embed digital teaching, learning and assessment in their curriculums and, and, and in their modules, uh, so as to improve the digital learning experience of students. Uh, and the IUA capitalised on this and, and received funding from the HEA to, to put together this, this project to achieve that, that, uh, that particular aim, which is ultimately to enhance the digital attributes and the digital educational experience of, of, of our university students in Ireland. And that aim is also uh, complemented by developing and, and, and implementing a staff development programme to help improve the digital skills and competences of all those who teach in Irish universities. And we particularly use the, the, the term all those who teach. We don't just um, focus on you know, full professors or assistant professors or, or anything like that, but we take a very broad approach to, to treating people who teach and people who support teaching. Um, the project largely is centered around campus-based instructors um, and helping them develop their, their, their digital skills in, in teaching and learning. Um, and even though the project itself, it, it, the title is about digital teaching and learning, really it's about digital education as, as a whole. Um, and uh, it, it covers um, digital learning design of, pro of programs, curriculums and, and modules. It covers teaching and learning, obviously. It also covers assessment, which is a particular uh, area that myself and, and Suzanne are interested in at, at DCU. Um, I see Sharon Flynn is here uh, uh, as one of the attendees. Sharon is the uh, project manager within the IUA. Um, uh, so please, Sharon, do jump into the chat if you have any uh, other contributions you'd, you'd like to make. Um, the approach is ultimately to mainstream digital teaching and learning. Um, in Irish universities by addressing the professional development of all those who teach. Um, we wanted to, a lot of us would be very familiar with this concept of champions or, you know, the, the one or two lecturers or professors in a department who are very, very skilled when it comes to digital teaching and learning. And they're the go-to people uh, when whenever anything digital takes place in, in teaching and learning. And I suppose the, the approach of this project is to move away from that idea of champions, but really to help mainstream digital in all that we do in university teaching and learning and to help mainstream everybody's skills um, in, in universities. The project is underpinned by, by four pillars. Um, the first one is, is this concept of not starting from zero because we are aware that professional development, uh, training, non-formal learning in this space takes place in, in all our institutions. Many institutions have accredited programs or accredited modules or offer suites of workshops or mentorship or occupational uh, training, etc. And this project certainly doesn't aim to come in and, and replace all that, but really build on what uh, the activities that are happening in the seven universities. We very much think about pedagogy first. We don't come in with a suite of tools and say you need to use these digital tools for assessment and, and learning learning and teaching, but we talk about the why and we talk about the rationale first and the technology comes later. We operate on a discipline basis, so we, we work with teams, teams of lecturers who are grouped together because they work on a particular programme or they're, in, they're all part of a particular department or, or a particular discipline. We don't um, work with kind of ad hoc um, lecturers or we don't work with a mishmash of, of lecturers from across the, the, the institution. We're very much discipline focused and working with teams to help build up their skills and competences. And the student voice is very important to us. Um, um, we have students involved in the project uh, at the steering group level. We, we ourselves, myself and Suzanne, have good relationships with the students' unions and student leaders in DCU. Um, and and uh, I'll come back to, to, to a new development we have as well around the student voice, uh, which has been particularly useful and, and exciting in recent times. 
all that we do is aligned to the Digicom BDU framework, which I'm sure most people here are familiar with. So all of our activities are, are linked to areas or to competencies on this framework so that the staff who are participating in the professional development activities have some sort of understanding or some sort of map of where their skills fit in the grand scheme of things and where they could potentially go to, to develop their skills further. So that's quite an important feature of the project as well. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the project is uh, across the seven Irish universities. We have a steering group made up of, of a number of members of, of senior management from the seven universities. And we found that that's quite important to have their buy-in and their support with this, with this three-year project, um, because that will go a long way to having some long-term impact with, with the support of senior management. I mentioned Dr. Sharon Flynn, who's, who's here attending the webinar today. She is the project manager, the, the wonderful project manager in, in the IUA who coordinates the activity activities and, and, and keeps us on, on, on track and, and keeps a, a bird's eye view of how the project is running in the seven universities. And then within the seven universities, there are project teams. So myself and, and Suzanne are the, the project co-leads in, in DCU, and uh, we have six counterparts in, in the other universities as well. We do have a, a student intern, Rory O'Gallagher, who works with Sharon in the IUA. And uh, recently, we have also recruited a number of um, interns within each of the, the seven universities, and, and we're blessed to have a wonderful intern, Laura Ann Scanlon, uh, who came on board in recent months uh, with myself and Suzanne to, to bring the student perspective and the student voice around all things digital teaching and learning. We conducted pilots in the last academic year in each of the um, universities. Um, again, you know, taking the approach that we're not starting from zero, we were aware that there were activities in all of the seven universities and it just didn't make sense for one kind of super approach to, to come in on top and, and be bedded in from, from the top down. This is really a bottom up approach to developing digital skills and competences. So even though we all ran a pilot in the seven universities, the pilots were all very, very different as you can see on screen there. And we in DCU decided to focus on the area of assessment. So we wanted to build lecturer skills in digital assessment um, through things like structured workshops, training, uh, consultation, guidance, um, and, and so on. And Susanna will delve into that a bit deeper shortly. Um, how our project maps with the underlying principle or how our project in DCU uh, aligns to the overall uh, uh, pillars of the of the national project are are, are that um, we kind of we, we in the teaching enhancement unit the TEU in DCU run a number of different professional development activities uh, on an ongoing basis uh, in a number of different areas um, so therefore when when we started our EDTL project in DCU we didn't again start from zero but we looked at what existing offerings we had in in in, in DCU and where we could take those and adapt those and build on those and, and bring in new offerings and bring in new work shops and so on. Um, we very much focus with our staff around why to use technology in assessment or we look at why to use a particular assessment approach and, and what's the benefit of that and what are the pros and what are the cons etc. And then we very much look at the how-to nature. So a lot of our workshops, for example, would be very discussion-based and teasing out assessment issues with staff and teasing out how technology can possibly help. And then we would usually follow up later with maybe some technical support and technical guidance. Um, our workshops are nearly, even, even though we have a suite of workshops available, they're nearly always tailored in one way or another to a particular discipline. So for working with the, the School of Languages or for working with the business school, they might be interested in, in, in broadly the same uh, topics and, and workshops, but they'll always be tailored uh, specifically to them. Um, we, as I mentioned, we have our intern, Laura Ann, who's wonderful in DCU. Uh, we have good relations with the Students' Union and, and, and their voice and perspective is important on this project. And we also run focus groups with students um, to hear from them as to their digital experience and their digital um, attributes uh, during their time of study in, in DCU, because again, ultimately the, the aim of the project is to improve the student digital learning experience. So we're quite uh, conscious of that. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Suzanne now, if that's okay. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'll let Suzanne jump in now and share hers. That's brilliant, Rob. Thanks so much. Um, so continuing on that conversation, just um, to talk a little bit about why we decided to fo 
focus on technology enhanced assessment. Um, I guess the, the, the research and the literature show that students are very much focused on assessment. And that's why we, we took the approach of, of um, tackling assessment head on because it has an influence on teaching and learning uh, in all its facets. Uh, so that's why we chose assessment. It's built, our project is built around four work packages um, centered around a staff development program. And, and Rob spoke a little bit about our, our approach to that program. But one of the, the four work packages, and you see, see all four of them there, is the development and maintenance, maintenance of online resources. And that's uh, what we're going to talk to you about today in, in terms of this um, open educational resource. So as we, um, as we piloted the EDTL project at DCU, we realized that uh, we had a, a need for um, a, a, an open education resource or, or an online resource of, of some kind. We didn't immediately think that it would be open, but um, we, we needed a resource to support staff to uh, imagine alternative types of assessment. We found that many academics were um, wedded to that traditional form of assessment, whether it be a uh, 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 an assignment or uh, even say from a technical point of view an online quiz we wanted to move beyond that and and give them some ideas around the types of assessment that they might um they might consider um uh, which would be supported by technology and actually we did uh, find some uh, some resources uh, online and and through the literature but we we decided that we we needed some more because uh, I guess we're working um, from a discipline specific point of view. And in many cases, for example, in, in kind of the humanities, there weren't a lot of um, of exemplars uh, or case studies available to us. So that's where the the kind of the idea for the, the open education resources was, was born. And uh, why did we take a crowdsourcing approach? Well, we felt that. There's a very rich um, uh, community around uh, technology enhanced learning, and uh, we felt that it was wise to draw on the community knowledge and experience. Uh, and then why take an open education resource approach? Why take an open approach? Well, it aligns with the teaching enhancement unit, uh, open practice. Um, uh, teaching enhancement unit is the unit at Dublin City University where myself and Rob are based. Uh, but it also aligns with our own personal ph philosophies of education. Uh, and also leaving the, the resource open allows for continuing development and, and a building uh, of the resource over time. So that's why we decided on the, um, the open education and the crowdsourcing approach. Just to, to speak to you a little bit about that cr crowdsourcing approach. Uh, we obviously, we hadn't intended for it to, to all happen online, but obviously events um, conspired uh, in March and that's how we have developed the, the, the resource. We uh, started at the Alts Winter Conference last, um, last December, so that was before the COVID, but we had intended that this would be something that we would present at conferences and that we would do in a face-to-face -face context as well. But uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, developed it online uh, since uh, last December, and it's building nicely. We have thirty exemplars in our in our resource now. But I guess uh, one of the difficulties of co-creating a resource online is the first in our first outing, we we realised that we needed um, to kind of counteract that silence. It can be quite a, an unnerving uh, experience for the presenters or the facilitators uh, for people to have a session where people are working independently because it can be quite silent and you can feel quite alone. So our approach was to take a, a kind of a relaxed and fun approach. We had some music playing in the background. We had some spot prizes, which went down very well. Uh, and then other kind of pointers, if, if people are considering this approach, we, um, there is a, a level of scaffolding required. We scaffolded it through discussing what we were seeing um, uh, people work on through, throughout the session. Uh, we didn't pressurize people to contribute or to, to, to um, create an exemplar on the spot. Uh, participants were invited to browse if they wish. So that kind of took the pressure off, off people. And then because it was, 
you know, every time that we've developed this resource in an online session, um, they've been short enough sessions. So sometimes people need to go away and think about um, the the exemplar, or the case study that they've contributed to the document. So we've left the document open for a couple of weeks after each event so that people can go back and edit if they wish. Uh, so again, that takes the pressure off to, to uh, contribute very quickly on the day. We also invite a contributor to, to discuss their case study in the webinar, but again, in a kind of a very nurturing fashion, no pressure, uh, and we've kept the atmosphere extremely relaxed throughout all of the sessions. Just to introduce you then to the, um, the resource itself, it's available here. We'll pop that into the chat box, and uh, I think uh, we're sharing the slides after this session in any case, so it'll be included in that um in the slides as well. So we've we've published a couple of times, we published earlier in the year uh, of the first version of the resource, uh, and we've published again um, just this week a, a second iteration of the open education resource. And what we're going to do is, is leave that as it is for the moment. And then later on, maybe next year in the spring, at some point, we'll open it up again for contributions. But um, at the moment, this is our published um, resource. And just, I just want to open it up and just show you very briefly one um, example. Can you see that case study, Orna? You might nod or Rob. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, excellent. So you'll see there's a, a small introduction and Rob has spoken to you a lot about that. We've got actually a a table of contents. It's created in a Google Doc, and I know we probably could have uh, looked at something a little bit more polished, but actually it just facilitates the contribution uh, really nicely. So we've stuck with the Google document for the moment. So you'll see there, title of the, the exemplar. Uh, we've got 11 headings in total, so you get an overview. This is an extremely comprehensive um, uh, entry into the, the OER but you get an overview of the technology enhanced assessment uh, the, an idea of the discipline that was used or the disciplines that the, the, the contributor feels that it might be relevant to the learning outcomes. It could align to skills, graduate attributes. It could align to which uh, speaks to the DigComp Edu framework um, referring back to that and uh, the technologies involved, some practical guidelines and considerations, possible grading criteria, some testimonials, which is fantastic. Uh, and then we've invited people as well to link outwards to, you know, something like an, a student assessment brief you'll see here. Uh, so that covers it, institution name, just in case you want to contact the, the person to have a chat in more detail and other notes. Uh, so people have chosen, uh, Felicity here has chosen to add some resources into our exemplar. So that's it, guys. I'm going to share out the um, the link to the um, to the resource into the. I think I've stopped sharing. Just give me two secs. Pardon me. Go back to the slides. Uh, yeah, it's just left for me to thank you for your attention, and we're available, obviously, for questions. I think, or now we're going to take a quick uh, question here at this point, and then. Uh, some more questions at the end of the session. Uh, but thank you for myself and Rob, and um, we're delighted to be invited today. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne and Rob. Fantastic resource. Uh, I have a question for you just to get the ball rolling. Which which is your favourite exemplar? I mean, there's some. I, I noticed there's some really nice additions since the last time I looked. You've got some really interesting stuff in there. Um, I, I don't think the, the podcasting one was there before. Very nice. So you've got a really like you've got a depth of types of assessment, but also a real depth in terms of disciplines as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of our, our, our aims of the, the, the creating the resource in, in the first place, because we found that in some disciplines there were plenty of case studies available around technology enhanced assessment. But for others, I think I mentioned earlier already for for the likes of the humanities discipline, uh, we didn't have as many. So that's growing. Still, we, we, you know, we're always open to more contributions. But um, in terms of a favorite, a recent favorite of mine is, um, uh, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but it's um, a, an assessment that uses, that combines two tools. So the Moodle glossary tool and the H5P open um, 
uh, open source uh, content de development tool. So essentially what uh, the user, what the exemplar explains is that the, the Moodle glossary was set up so that uh, students could create and share H5P content um, uh, and the glossary was used to collate those. Students commented on, on the, uh, the, the H5P content types. Um, so I thought that was a really nice idea. Combining, it sounds reasonably complicated, but actually when you break it down, it, it, it's a really nice, simple idea and builds a lot of uh, digital skills for the student uh, through that process. And you've got a lovely bit of peer review going on there too, which is just really nice. And that glossary tool is a great tool, uh, vehicle for that in Moodle. So any other questions at this point? There was one in the Q&A, which I might just put to you as well. Um, so is it specific to Moodle or other tools? Uh, from, from me glancing at it, it seems, it seems open to lots of tools. Um, proctoring doesn't feature, I don't think, does it? No. No. Uh, it doesn't. Rob, do you want to come in there? Yeah, no, we do, we don't have any examples of proctoring in um, in in um, in the OER uh, document. Um, uh, I won't I won't open a debate on on on, on proctoring. We, we might be here all day. Uh, but generally, I mean, as an open as an open education resource and, and as one that's crowdsourced, uh, the tools are are varied. They're not specific to any particular VLE, uh, and that's exactly what we want. We want it to be as diverse as possible, and we want to crowdsource as as widely as possible. So, uh, the, the the more open, the better. I think with this with this resource. Absolutely. And I'd say staff really appreciate those examples because imagining what an assessment can look like, it can be really challenging. So having good examples like that uh, can really help people design some good assessment. And I see Diane coming in there on proctoring. Actually, at the session yesterday, we did get, we did start proctoring bashing. So don't be afraid. Uh, so <laughs> oh, that's one of my hobby horses, too. So uh, not, so I don't wanna, I don't want to explode the chat box now. Um, but Thank you, Susanna, Rob. Really interesting contribution on a super resource. I have to say, I, I really like it. And maybe if people from the session were interested in contributing to the resource, they could get in touch with you if they had some interesting examples. We would love that. We would absolutely love that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Super. Thanks to you both. Now for our next dream team, we have Karen and Tom from ePortfolio Ireland a fantastic community of practice. And I am completely biased because I am also in this community of practice. So just to introduce them both, Tom is a member of the steering committee of uh, ePortfolio Ireland and a social science lecturer and educational developer at IT Trilly. His research interests are in technology enhanced learning, open education and ePortfolio. He is editor of the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning. And Karen Buckley is an assistant professor in the School of Inclusive and Special Education at Dublin City University. Her interests include inclusive pedagogy, inclusive practice, and she's a doctoral candidate in Maynooth University where she's exploring professional development in higher education. So over to you, Karen and Tom. Thanks, Sorna, and hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Um, I'm sure you can see my screen or you might just give me a, a wee thumbs up. Fantastic. Um, my name is Karen Buckley and thanks for that warm welcome and introduction, Orna. Delighted to co-present with Tom here today on behalf of ePortfolio Ireland. Um, we're a small network um, which includes Lisa Donaldson, the esteemed Orna Farrell, uh, Tom and myself. And maybe just to give you all a little overview of what we do. Um, ePortfolio Ireland is a professional learning network. Um, we are ePortfolio practitioners and researchers, and we're all based in Ireland. There's a bit of a Dublin City University slant, uh, where Orna, Lisa, and I are based in Dublin City University. Um, so poor Tom is representing the, uh, the South, and he does it very, very well with lots of classes, as you can imagine. And um, we were really established, I guess, back in 2017 as Mahara IRL. But we rebranded quite quickly back in 2018 to better represent the broader interests of all members. And again, I suppose this was a decision based on 
I suppose, trying to consider all tools that are used for e-portfolio practice as well. So we are a grassroots community. We have a voluntary steering group. Um, we're really quite active um, in online and face-to-face -face events, or we used to be more active in face-to-face -face events. But really, our, our main mission and aims is to support the professional development of all those who teach and ongoing collaboration between e-portfolio practitioners in higher education institutions. We've also broadened out to further um, education or adult education institutions here in Ireland and actually we're seeing a lot of members in our community who also work in second level um, education settings as well. So we welcome all and we're delighted to be able to present to you today on, on some of the activities that we have and I suppose I'm, I'm maybe going to start a little bit talking about what type of e-portfolio activities we have in DCU and then we're going to I'm uh, going to pass you over to Tom then where we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the opportunities that ePortfolio offers to be able to engage with pedagogically robust alternative assessments. And that's really our, our aim for today. Um, so some of the activities that we do, and I want to maybe draw your attention to our website, which is ePortfolioIreland.wordpress.com. I have it on screen there. And what you'll see is there's lots in our website about what we do, some of our recent activities, and um, also some really nice free open source resources that are available to you on some of the um, events that we've held over the past three years as well. But really our ultimate aim is to share our understanding of ePortfolio practice in Ireland to support robust assessment, to support employability skills, and um, to support good teaching, learning and assessment across all elements of our practice. Um, and we're really lucky that we have, I guess, a great network of e-portfolio enthusiasts with broadened or the variety of different skills and knowledge and competencies with regards to e-portfolio. Um, and even, I guess, within our steering group, we have different levels of expertise with regards to e-portfolio. And that certainly has been and it's shaped us to be one of a really interesting grassroots uh, membership because we were able to maybe share practice, we're able to promote ideas and also be able to connect practitioners with what is happening on the ground as well. It's, it's been really, really interesting. To think about how ePortfolio has offered us an alternative uh, assessment that's pedagogically robust. Um, I suppose we in DCU in particular have considerable history with ePortfolio based assessment in particular. Um, ePortfolio has been fairly widely adopted across all faculties, all five faculties in DCU to serve a variety of teaching, learning and assessment purposes. And we see that from an initial launch back in 2017 uh, of our loop reflect, as we call it, we have an increase in the number of active accounts of up to about 42% of all users across the university, which equates to about just under 10,000 active accounts in 2019-2020. Um, so it's a really significant um, and important approach to our I suppose, uh, teaching, learning and assessment practices here. And we're really trying to support all practitioners to test and to try out ePortfolio as a tool to support teaching and learning. And as I mentioned, that ePortfolio has been fairly widely adapted across our faculties. Um, I suppose in the last seven or eight months with COVID-19, it has really proven to be a catalyst for lecturers to embrace ePortfolio-based assessment as an alternative assessment. And this last semester alone, over 60 separate modules here in DCU are using ePortfolio with their students. As the pandemic has required us a rethinking and a reimagining of assessment due to the inability to conduct in-person examinations and just the way that we are teaching in a more blended or a more hybrid approach. So I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Tom to talk about why ePortfolio is useful and why it can be used as a alternative assessment tool. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, absolutely professional and unflappable, which puts me in an awful position because I, I wing it most of the time like that and relying on my innate uh, charm and good humour. And, and apologies, there's a little dog in the background you may hear barking. So that's, I don't have children, small children to put up, but my, my baby is 25, so that's a slightly different issue. Anyway, I think it, Karen has really hit the nail on the head in terms of the last year. I think we have been challenge obviously with, with with doing a lot of things differently and uh sort of paraphrasing david bow when he talks about we can students can to, to varying degrees of success um get away with bad teaching 
but you know bad assessment is very hard, difficult to overcome so i suppose that they and it, whether we like it or not when we talk about um education and all of that, that go to it a lot of the times like the, the, the end game is, is, is the assessment strategy and we need something that that can stand up and be robust and i think there's a lot of concerns about validity and reliability and i suppose you know we, we would certainly be arguing that uh, e-portfolios certainly provide that opportunity so you know uh, we would i think we would talk about it because we think it's a very good process and, and very good education but even for those who were more concerned with the reliability and validity I still think that it, it would it would it would certainly give uh, a, a a much broader uh, aspect and more robust uh, way, and not just as opposed to if you think really portfolios originally would come from some the, the, the more uh, you know, art based uh, subjects, but as we one thing we've seen here is the, the whole wide range of academic uh, disciplines there, and as I said, also if we look at a lot more professions are now moving towards that idea of continual professional development. How then do you actually how do you capture that in a dynamic way? And I suppose uh, e-portfolios in particular, but or, or, or the general, but e-portfolios in particular, because we, we actually do have that that opportunity to uh, to move forward. Um, so as I suppose, the student, as I said, they're just co- quoting here uh, a couple of quotes here. Their student uh, centered activity, one in which the, the student is free to choose what artifacts are included. I suppose that. That is one of the, those major things. It's actually showing. I mean, if you if, if you look at sort of the the, the, the what sort of higher end skills, um, uh, and we're talking about Bloom's or the revised version, Anderson's taxonomy there, and like at the high end, we're talking about selection and creation, and that's really showing that that higher level of of, of skills there. And so, as I said, it's it's really putting it back to them rather than here's a three thousand word essay, here's the title I'm going to give you. Uh, no, I'm actually giving it back to you. That can be quite scary and frightening for people because, uh, you know, a lot of people we've become so accustomed to. What do I think? What am I to think, sir? What? So I suppose that's the thing there. Um, and as I said, students, uh, you know, so so I suppose it's that idea. I mean, I like that thing about integration, inspiration. It's really giving back that 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 choice that you know, say for innovative and authentic assessments and one of the things there I, I myself and, and two colleagues in, in Tralee done some research last year and it certainly bore, bore out a lot of what we found I think a lot of people well, were viewing staff weren't quite sure they didn't do a unique portfolios because it's, it's fair enough if you're using pedal pad or pad right arm or hard then you're using a, a definitive definitely portfolio platform but actually a lot of people were using the journal facility on 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 their VLE or some people were using what they got the students to do was curate six videos and write a description on YouTube that's an e-portfolio any collection of work where you've had to select and stuff there so as you can see here there's a not there's a, there's a hell of a lot of, of, of choices in terms of what constitutes an e-portfolio the main thing is that it's as I said it's innovative and it's authentic because you're actually in in real life so to speak to use that awful phrase that that's what you're, you're being asked to choose. Can you do this for next week? Can you come up with a solution? And this is, this is a knee portfolio is a manifest way of saying, this is my work. This is what I chose. And this is what, what, what I produced there. So if you look here, as I said, this is collection and select. I mean, one of the things I particularly love about e portfolio is like the, 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 the traditional sort of portfolio is just words and just text. But if you think about it, there's, there's so much more. Like one of the projects, you said that I would have been involved in, uh, you know, said it's, um, with, with, with uh, e-portfolios for nursing students. So even one of the, the, the learning outcomes for nursing is that you should be a health promotion educator. Well, now you can actually, you know, maybe make a Powtoon video or some sort of thing and then put it into your collection rather than just writing up, I done this and writing, I done that. That's not to say writing doesn't have its part to play. I think the whole reflective element and sort of, teeing it up because that's also showing the process and how you actually capture that and as i said that that also then what i particularly like about portfolios is where you can show that the student has written something the lecturer can can comment on it and then you feed back now that's real learning that's that real sort of learning and as i said the the, the record learning from work placements there i think you know with so many Degrees now have some element of placement or some element of, of, of going out and putting it into practice. So this is a tangible way because if you think about it, a lot of students when they come out, uh, you know, from, from university, yes, they have the degree, but what else have they to show? 
because there's lots of people with a degree. So what's going to mark you out? And this is a tangible way. This is not just me sitting at the interview. I can send you a link on. So in advance of the of the interview, it's already changed and become a far more far more dynamic uh, process. So there's some examples there, Karen. Are we actually playing the video? This is this is where they are. We just so as I said. So this I think in terms of actual practical resources, and I'm going to let Karen now come back and uh, hopefully I haven't made a show of B portfolio where I'm I'm very aware that Orna is also Do you know what? As well. he, he calls me unflappable but Tom you're an absolute pro so I won't take any heed of you now anymore with this unflappable nonsense it was absolutely perfect Tom and I mean I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head it is about opening up new opportunities what are the potential for e-portfolio we're all having these conversations now about alternative ways of doing um, and actually following on from Suzanne and Rob's presentation, I think one of the real beauties about having these conversations like we are in, in the Eden webinars is about actually trying to share some of our existing resources. And I think Orna has just popped it into the chat there a moment ago, where we have some really nice examples of e-portfolio based assessment in an e-book. It's a free open resource that's available to you. Um, and it really tries to provide uh, real life examples, ways of, of trying out, whether it's taking small um, starter steps in e-portfolio practice, or maybe if it's about refining or um, redefining how you use e-portfolio for assessment in all of your teaching and learning. But there's really some nice ideas. It was a kind of a crowdsourced way that we could disseminate and to share some key practices in e-portfolio that are going on um, across Irish institutions over the past couple of years. So I think that would be a really nice resource to for you to look at and, and for you to explore. And I think it would complement um, Suzanne and Rob's uh, recent publication as well. I, I think they they could really be helpful to any new practitioners or, you know, for any of those who want to re-examine or redefine what we want to do moving forward for the next year. I think we will wrap it up and would love to take any questions that you do have uh, on ePortfolio Ireland. Um, as ever, we will we will share these slides and any resources that we've mentioned. But please um, check us out on our website, eportfolioireland.wordpress.com or follow us on Twitter. We're quite Twitter active. So get in touch with us that way and we'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Can I give a shout out that we uh, hopefully will have a special issue of our Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning, which has been guest edited by ePortfolio Ireland. So we're busy putting all that together and hopefully in, in, in the, the new year we'll have that that edition out. Good. Thanks, Karen and Rob. And I've been I've been setting off the chat a bit there, getting a bit of debate going about which is which is important, the process or the product. Mm -hmm. um, so so any thoughts on that to begin with? And there's actually a few more in the QA I'll put to you in a second as well. So process or product. Oh, I mean I'm a I'm a teacher educator, I'm a moonshore. By trade, so I have to say the process. I mean, I would be fired on the spot if I said it was all about the product. But ultimately, I mean, and I guess the reason why we're talking about assessment is that it's a huge part of our quality standards. We we can't ignore, you know, the end product as a way of, of measuring our students' performance. But, you know, I, I think it's a combination of both. It's trying to find that balance is the sweet spot that I think we all find really right. difficult. I, I think the beauty of ePortfolio is, is at least presenting the process to the group. I, I think uh, particularly for group work, um, I often have uh, some re reservations where you see assessments characterized as, you know, th this is a, a, about assessing the group dynamic and the group, uh, the group processes. But actually, when you actually look at the, the how the marks are allocated, you're going to go, no, you've actually done it for the product. Yeah. So I think e portfolios is a way of genuinely, you know, mapping that, that, that process. Mm. Okay, so yeah, that that was just me, uh, you know, getting things going. Um, Stirring the pot. You, you, you probably already, those of you who know me probably already know my answer. Uh, I would always reward the process more heavily than the product. So I'd be in the in the waiting, I would be giving the process 80 or 70 and the product, the, the remaining. Uh, because that's the message you want to give to students is we reward the effort, we reward the messy learning, not the shiny thing at the end. Because the actually problem, where the learning in portfolios, sorry, Tom, sorry. where the learning happens in portfolios is the messy bit. Go ahead, Tom. But the problem is, I suppose, unless you have built a robust assessment system, the easiest thing to assess is the product because you can see it, you can feel it, you can weigh it, so to speak. And I think that's the thing where something which, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, to, 
a paraphrase, another quote, that everything that matters we can't always count and everything that we can count doesn't always matter. And I think sometimes, as I said, unless we, we are prepared to put in the hard work to, to find a way of tracking that process, we will end up just, oh, look at the shiny piece of work that you've exactly. finished. And, and you don't see the blood, sweat, toil and tears that went into the production, to quote no. Winston Churchill. Um, so lots of lots of interesting comments. I might just pick out one other one comment, actually, which is a nice one. Any advice for someone just starting off with ePortfolio or considering introducing it into their in, with their students? Um, start simple. I think that's the thing. Like, you know, there is a, a temptation to become enamored by the technology. Uh, and, and, and as I said, like, I'm not saying I'm not saying we shouldn't be raising the bar, but the, the, the problem is you might be particularly adept. Uh, and I think, you know, going back to certainly now that people are working at a distance, you don't know what broadband capability mm. you, people have. You don't know what software ca- uh, packages that they have. I, I mean, I've had students this year who are sharing family laptops uh, and it might be a seven year old laptop. So even relatively what I think is relatively OK and easy to do. So I think pick something which, and, and and above all else, it's still about the pedagogy. And Karen has said that, and that was what she started off the whole thing. It's still about the pedagogy. You know, can you make this fancy doodly or video scribe video? Maybe you can, but, but someone else can't. So sorry, yeah, I talked too much. That. No, I, I, I would agree with that, Tom. I mean, I, I think one of the key and most important features of a successful e-portfolio implementation actually has to do with time and I totally take on board the right technology is important looking at the right tool that's obviously important using what you have in your own virtual learning environments or whatever tools are available to you and your students but actually it's about building in uh, scheduling time actually um, regular consistent uh, use of of engaging in the process of e-portfolio development both for you and, and your students I, I would think is is an important feature and, and a, a space to start um, you know, for, for me, I've, I've a range of different e-portfolios, uh, some for my professional practice, some for my, my studies, my doctoral studies. Um, but also, I mean, think about some of the microblogging tools that you already use. I mean, you know, are you engaged in, in social media? Do you blog on Twitter? Do you use LinkedIn, for example, as a, a blogging tool or as a way to kind of capture um, some of your academic or work achievements but think about maybe some of the tools that you already have see what works for you see what styles of of uh, technologies will work and just put the time into maintaining it and to foster it that would be my recommendation thank you karen and tom some 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 really interesting conversation going on that hopefully we'll come back to in the in the final q a session um so, so some very some heated debating going on about assessment, which is brilliant. Uh, and just to echo your sentiment there about Karen about the professional uh, e-portfolio, it doesn't have to be an e-portfolio platform. If you've got a blog or if you've got a Twitter, I totally agree. You know that that is uh, uh, you reflecting and collating your professional development equally is valid. Um, so our final speaker is another. The, the fabulous Dr. James Brunton, uh, from, also from Dublin City University. So you, you, there may be a bit of a DCU theme if you haven't picked up on that yet. Um, so James is an assistant professor and chair of the DCU Connected uh, BA in Psychology major, which is an online program based in DCU. So online before COVID, still online now. Uh, James is a member of the Digital Learning Research Network. His research interests include the psychology of identity formation, socialization and orientation processes for off-campus online higher education students, online learning design, open pedagogy and digital assessment. And so today he's going to talk about some really nice open pedagogy assessment work he has worked on for the last year or two, James, is it? Sorry, my unmute button moved. Um, for the last three years, I think, uh, I think 17, 18 was the first year that we, we started doing that. Is Mike, can you see my screen? Sure can. Okay. Do you want to go full screen there, James? You're just telling Andrea to be quiet. <laughs> Is 
Here we go. Is that you can see that now, can't you? Great. Uh, so yeah, as as Anne, as as uh, Orna said, um, I work in DCU. I work in on a DCU connected program. I've worked uh, on online programs, open access programs since 2010 here. Um, and what I'm talking about today is is part of our efforts to bring in more um, open pedagogy assessment into the program. Um, so. Oh, uh, also, as Orna already said, so I'm I'm the chair of uh, the psychology major program, um, and what that means in our kind of model, we have a, a particular type of online distance learning model where it's a small full time team who then coordinates with a bigger part time adjunct faculty team. Uh, so we're very much kind of at the cog of this big web. Um, and we're trying to make everything. Uh, we're trying to make everything uh, stick together. Um, so, as part of that, a lot of the drive for innovation kind of comes from us as sort of program chairs or module coordinators um, on these programs. And I suppose over the ten years that I've worked on on programs in DCU, uh, I've gone through a series of of innovations trying to increase the variety of assessment types um, in different in different modules um, trying like as it's, it's a common theme across the, the different presentations today uh, trying to uh, shift the balance from you know being more heavily weighted in traditional essay style assignments to having a nice wide variety that feed back into different program learning outcomes so you know how people communicate how they work together how they reflect on things bringing in uh, e-portfolios into some of the modules you know um and then working with the the part-time teams to try and make sure that they are fully, that everybody in the teams is fully on board and trying to overcome some re resistance that some people might have where they're like, no, we should just have essays or report writing. We should, they should just be writing all the time. Um, or people trying to get used to how do we assess this? It's harder to figure out how to assess someone using this rubric for a reflection than it was to just correct an essay, which people feel they, they kind of have in their soul, they know how to assess an essay. Um, so uh, in some of our psychology modules, um, you know, this process was ongoing and I suppose I'm seeing things on Twitter, I'm he hearing things in events like this. I was especially uh, in some conferences seeing presentations on really interesting ways to approach assessment. And, um, some of some like OE global conferences and uh, oh, other conferences like that, all the conferences that, that kind of in this area. And I was seeing people talk about different ways of opening up assessment to get away from this idea of the disposable assignment that people do their assignments, it gets corrected, they might they get their feedback, and then we put it in an archive and it's never sees the light of day again. We just put it in the shredder and everyone forgets about it. Um, and I put out the call to my team to see, okay, what can we do? Um, what kind of different ideas? What, where could we bring in real life examples or real life data sets to use? Where could we get students to make things that could go out in the public? Where might students work in the public or in the public eye? Or where might they produce things that we bring back into the program? You know, how can we make the, get them making stuff that will have, have a purpose, have a life of its own outside of just being something to be assessed? So Megan Gaffney, who works on a couple of our modules, was the first person to kind of come back to me and say, I love this idea. Let's, let's try that. Um, and so on this uh, developmental and educational psychology module, we started to sit down and look at what could we do differently. Um, so I, I suppose another thing, this is part of, this is only one part of trying to be open. Um, we try to be open in lots of different ways. Like the, the program that I work on or the, the, even the family of programs that it comes from, the humanities programs, they're open access programs. Um, anyone over the age of 23 who wants to come and study on a high, uh, honors level higher education course can get in. So we have open education is kind of built into what we do. We have flexible progression routes and we're always 
trying to see within the resources that we have, where can we put in more openness? How can we open it up in different ways? Um, so, and as a, as a quick segue, if you want to look at more of these possibilities, um, this is a total side, sidebar, uh, I'm involved in an EU funded project, uh, Open Game, which is eventually trying to make a, a actual interactive game to help pe encourage people into open educational practices. But some of the early outputs from that um, from that project include a whole uh, a whole handbook of examples of open educational practice. What I'm talking about today is one of them, but there are others on assessment. There's others on teaching. There's others. There's all sorts of different ideas in there. So opengame-project.eu if you want to go check check that out. Um, so what we did, I'm probably skipping a bit ahead in the slides, but what we did was the, there was an existing, um, there was an existing assignment where students, uh, thought about how they might, uh, promote to a school, a certain educational psychology topic. And it, it what Megan saw in, in my suggestions about, okay, how can we open up assessments was, yeah, I, you know, she always uh, thought when she saw these assignments, some of these would actually make really good, uh, you know, pieces of information to go to schools. Like schools could benefit from some of the work the students were doing, but like it didn't have that function. So that's what we tried to uh, imbue. You know, uh, there's there, out of three assignments during the year, their second assignment, which was focused on developmental um, psychology we got them to sort of just do a, a, a more regular uh, assignment where they would research a certain topic, like let's say mental health and well-being or something like that from a developmental psychology standpoint. And then in their final one, they would kind of come at, come at that uh, subject or that topic again from a, a educational or educational psychology standpoint, um, but actually work that up into either an infographic or a, a pamphlet and a digital pamphlet that we would actually put out in the public eye. So this is an example of one of the students uh, sort of posters. We let them take a couple of different formats, infographic, digital pamphlet, poster. Um, and we actually, we, we then collect, collected these and put them onto uh, a WordPress blog. Now, I think there's different ways we could have done that. Possibly we could have done it better. Um, I know other people were talking about we could have got them to blog it themselves and then federated or pulled all those into one overarching blog. Um, but I suppose we were conscious of not wanting to ask the students to do too much. So we got them to do it, give their permission. And then those who gave their permission, we put them up on, we put them up on this website. Um, we wanted to follow up and we are still following up on how this is going and um, so we uh, did an online focus group after the first year that we that we did it and we kind of we analyzed it using uh, thematic analysis um and this this is sort of the the early results from that first year we have collected data last year as well due to 2020 covid madness we have not um we haven't really gotten to the second year and we have decided that we want to do it again uh this year before we kind of really push forward and write it up but uh the the results were really interesting in that students you know they, they really in seem to engage with this as a good idea they they recognize this as something novel something engaging they struggled with it a little bit especially those who were maybe a little less used to making uh, making something graphically pleasing um you know and i suppose the first year you could see vague instructions the first year maybe we didn't quite get it right i mean i think we were we were figuring out how to release this to the public as the assignment was unfolding the first time um but the 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 huge thing the really thing the thing that i thought was so impactful was um it really made them reflect on what they were doing. It made them think about producing an assignment in a different way. Now that it was going to go somewhere, like suddenly there was all these ideas about how do you communicate to people? Like, how does the public get information? At what point do I stop being responsible for this being out in the world? Uh, you know, do, will someone else take responsibility for this if there's something wrong with it? You know, and it really made them, it really made them think about all these different uh, topics. 
I'm not going to talk through these quotes, but you'll just you'll just see like it it gives a flavor of what I was uh, just saying, you know, and, and it, it it got them thinking about, you know, in their journey, some of them uh, towards being a psychologist or working in fields in psychology. It was at what point am I good enough? At what point is the information I'm giving out valid, or you know, can I stand over it, or or at what point can people get use out of what I'm saying? Um, so. Yeah, and also who is the public? All this kind of thing. Like who who are we talking to? Um, so that's that's it. I suppose what I would say is we're continuing to use this assignment. Um, there's a number of other places. We haven't done anything as clear cut in terms of uh, that I could point to and say, look, there's an open pedagogy assignment. But I know that in some of our research methods modules in the psychology major, people are using um, real life data sets rather than some artificially created data set as was that's one that's another form of of open assessment um and we have some we have some other places where i want to keep pushing to see if we can tweak assignments so that what the students produce um could be used can go back into the course as video content or or other kind of infographic content and um, but we're just not it's not quite there it's like it's always about how many innovations can you try and put into uh, each year uh, given the amount you can actually do um i think that i got my plug in for open game and everything so i think that that's the uh that's the i'll stop sharing thanks james um some really interesting stuff there and I sh shared the blog there with with the with in the chat yeah. and I was just having a look at some of the examples and it's very interesting the effect of having to showcase work on students um you know and, and how that they had to learn about effective communication and how it had to be polished and well presented I think the, the that obviously changed their 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 way of doing things yeah, they 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 really, it really made them think about their work in a way that they never had before, you know. And that that's what that's what came out in the the data collection. Um, that it, it was just fund it was fundamentally different. It was a little bit the only other one, the only other assignment they compared it to was an organizational psychology assignment where they had to uh, record a video as if they were sort of talking authoritatively on a topic, but that it's with, and then they peer review each other, but that's still closed. And like, that's the assignment, I think their scope to actually get them to just do a short piece on what it, topics and then actually use some of them in the course. But they thought it was a little bit similar to that, but then it went totally beyond it because they were actually putting it out. Um, they were actually putting it out in the public. The only, thing about, the only thing about the blog is we haven't even updated it with, last year's uh work yet because yeah because of 2020. 2020 hashtag yeah, hashtag 2020 damn you 2020 um so james just to to draw on some of maybe the background stuff that inspired this i was just thinking like rajif's Rajif work uh that cyprof on on psych on twitter might be a nice thing to share with the the chat and what's that open cookbook thing they have which i think again Oh, uh, there's an open, is there an open pedagogy cookbook patch or something? Book, patch, book. patch book. Yeah, that's really good. So, yeah, you might want really to lash them in there, but but yeah. certainly Raj, or Jeff uh, at, at Cyprof on, on Twitter, if you're interested in open pedagogy or uh, open educational resources mm. is, is well worth a follow. Yeah. And I think, I think um, like some of the stuff out of that open game project that I was uh, plugging earlier, um, Sometimes I think it can be intimidating if you go to uh, some of the websites that talk about open pedagogy, because open pedagogy is a, a complex intellectual thing to like come at from that angle. Often uh, it's easier to think about what's going on in classrooms, what's going on between you know teachers and students, and what can you change by using some of these open educational practices. And it's, it's often it might be easier for people to start there and then start to learn how to do that. And then they'll arrive at open pedagogy. You know, it's like if you're using a real life data set, you're doing it. If you're somehow taking something students are doing, if you're getting them to blog and Pete, that's kind of public, but you're protecting the students and the students understand what they're doing. 
that's open pedagogy, you know, rather than sort of looking at something where it's like, it's a praxis of duh, 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 like, that's, that's very complicated. And some people might go, I don't know what's going on here. I, I don't like this. It's scary. It's very um, theoretically heavy area, but actually when you see an, like a, a, like your example there of, of what you can do, I think it kind of, it kind of breaks down some of the yeah. theory and they do like to use some heavy, heavy language like praxis, mm. which is, a, which can be a bit daunting. There's a nice question there for you, James, in the chat. I'll put it to you now privacy issues uh, around publishing the student work that's a good yeah one. so uh the students did not have to publish it um it's it's effectively you know, like layer one it's a closed assignment they do their work individually they submit it through moodle as normal with that then they can opt to put a permission with it that it can be taken and put online i then take everything that has a permission slip and I give it just a, a, a once over to make sure that the student has understood what was going on. I think the first year there was a student who maybe misinterpreted a tiny bit and was putting official government logos on it as if it was a government piece of information. It was like, okay, that cannot go up because that does not have, that shouldn't be on there. But like, so I just do a once over and then the stuff was shared online where the student had permission to do that. And I mean, a, a big thing is to ensure that students understand that. And it's the big part of open pedagogical ass assessment is you have to protect the students or make sure the students are making an informed decision. You know, if students are blogging or vlogging publicly, they're putting themselves at risk to a certain level, depending on who they are and all that. So I think there always has to be a plan B. There always has to be an opt out. Um, and depending on the depending on the the learning outcomes, that might be more or less problematic. But like you always have to think about that. You know, certain people might not, might need to not be out there in the public eye or be putting their name on things, or you know, there can be sensitivities around that stuff. So there always has to be um, a plan for how you students have a different way of of doing things. Very nice point, James. Sharon has a good point there um, about how it gives an opportunity to speak about privacy. Also, licensing. Are they? Did you do Creative Commons licensing on those? I asked. I in in what I put to the students, I said you don't have to do this, but if if you're giving what I'm asking you to give the permission for is CCBY, um, and I tried to I tried to explain that, and I mean, there's a number of. I mean, in asking them to produce something that could be shared publicly, that required, uh, you know, um, content in their assessment documentation and discussion with the students around what licensing meant, because they then can't take copyrighted images and put them on there, you know, because that's going to create a problem. So it's a, uh, again, to come back to that open game one, so another, the first output of that was a competency framework where we tried to figure this out. And it is, as soon as you start in on any of these activities, there are underlying competencies where all of a sudden it's like, mm, you do need to know about licensing and copyright and how that works before you can kind of do this. You do need to know how to lead students in knowing about that. You know, so there's this kind of a, there's always a bit of a, 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 a matrix of things you end up figuring out. You do need to know about these things. And if you're leading students in doing that, you need to be able to help them get there um, substantially before you do it. And, and you're really hitting some of those, those, those uh, skills on that DigiComp framework, if you think about it too. So I mean, students are really developing their knowledge of internet safety, licensing, privacy. So you, you're hitting a whole load of themes there, which is fantastic. So now I think, thanks James, your contribution, very interesting um, discussion around open pedagogy. One, one I'm interested in myself, and one I have, I've, I've swam through the the open sea of praxis, trying to get my head around. But I think um, nice to see a good practical example. So I think now we have time for a bit of bit more questions to the panel. So you know, put your questions in the chat or the Q and A box um, for anyone. Any any one of the panel, we might take a look back at some of the previous discussion around assessment uh, to start us off as well. I will jump right in, Orna. Do it, Vlad. Uh, so I'm uh, for everyone here. I'm the diversity here. You can uh, figure from my name and from my lack of accent, I'm not Irish. Uh, so <laughs> I, I saw a question uh, in the Q and A, uh, and this got me thinking. Uh, we have this discussion with other colleagues about uh, uh, new ways of uh, assessing students 
And then they say, okay, but this works for a small group of students. What about scaling? And I saw a question in the Q&A uh, in relation to uh, scaling for e-portfolios, but I would extend this question about uh, scaling for, for various types of um, assessment activities. Uh, what are the assessment activities that cannot be scaled if, if that's the case? And uh, how you should work as a teacher to, to, to better, better do the scaling thing for, for the assessment? This is a question for all the panelists. Um, can I just respond? I think one of the things is that um, some of the courses I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, would have large numbers. Say like students would have maybe, well, for our college, it would be have 90 students in a year, which is which is quite a big year. That's a lot of portfolios. Um, I suppose one to do is to scale up is to have a team of assessors. The only problem, I suppose, is inter-rater reliability. I suppose that's one of the things that you do need to have a really robust rubric and uh, and and a robust interpretation of that rubric because I think rubrics I think sometimes we throw them out as as some sort of panacea. There, you know, it's it's we we need to have a good collective idea and and I suppose the thing is particularly the more complex I suppose the more moving parts we say we're in a portfolio. Um, I think that's one of the issues. So scalability could be an issue, and as I said, but I think it's it's too much for one person. So rubrics and training to get everybody to sort of have have a good sense of of what it is. That that'd be my thoughts about scalability. Just to jump in there as well, and and to invite my colleagues Rob and Suzanne to join in on on this suggestion as well. We were in the middle of conducting some research on the swift swift move of a moving a very large class or a number of very large classes online since March 2020 here in Dublin City University. Um, and I suppose in that project we surveyed staff and students, particularly those in large classes, and we just we define large classes of anything over. Uh, 100 students um, and actually we came up with some really um, clear immediate actions and considerations to take into account I suppose to to answer your question Vlad about scalability what considerations need to be made I think ultimately what it comes down to is the principles for good robust effective assessment need to be maintained and um, if we are quite clear on exactly what are the uh, principles that support our, our, our learning outcomes, we, we can scale quite effectively. But as Tom said, it's about tooling up. It's about getting the, the support that we need and to do that effectively. And if I may just share my screen very quickly, um, I'm going to actually share with you um, some quick guidance that, that we have just published as kind of an interim report. Um, and here with our moving large face-to-face -face classes online, we have some guidance here for HE teachers, higher education teachers. And I suppose that was contributed to by the data we collected from staff and students here in DCU, but also informed by literature on large class teaching and learning and current publications on the swift pivot for COVID-19. So there's some immediate actions and considerations to take into account for assessment and then some ongoing um, ongoing actions and, and tips and techniques. So we will pop that in the, the chat box for you as well. Might be useful. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that's a lovely resource as well. Go ahead and put it in the chat. I think I've put up nearly all the resources in the chat that have been shared. And I think, the, uh, James, if you share your, your slides as well, I think everything has been everything has been shared already. Um, and it will go up on the Eden website later as well, along with the recording. So if you've missed anything, you can get it there. There's a couple more questions coming in. Unless anyone wants to ask James or, or Suzanne or Rob want to come in about the scaling question. I, I, yeah, I would just say it, it Again, it's complicated. It, it depends on your teaching and learning model and it depends on sort of the learning design approach in, in the modules. You know, to, if, if you have a way of, you know, layering on extra supports where you need them, then, you know, it's easier to scale to bigger classes. I mean, it's the same with any assessment. We often have this discussion because, you know, our uh, our adjunct faculty are part time. So you can't just design the best assignment ever that requires uh, an academic to be, you know, working with the students 24 seven for four months or something, you know, you, it's just, it's just, that's not doable. That's not scalable. Um, so you have to figure out what is, what is practical, where can the work be put reasonably and on the students with them being supported to do that work. 
um you know and to to get a good outcome so it it depends on it depends on a lot of variables but you can you can kind of see how uh and how something might be too complicated or not scalable enough but in that case you might want to start start small and have like a a 2 3 year plan in year 1 we'll get them doing you know we'll get them working in groups in year 2 we'll get them working in groups but they share their their uh, their work publicly in year three we'll get some help and we'll actually have them do it right in wikipedia or something you know so you have to move that way slowly i mean i want to get students working in wikipedia somehow but it scares me still a little bit um me too james you know yeah and it's just it's just you know baby steps and then you know i'm uh, nearly for the i'm nearly ready for the year three with one of my wikipedia assignments I have them building wikis in, in Moodle and the next phase is to to go into Wikipedia. So, yeah, I, I think I think your point there about doing it in phases, you know, uh, is a good a good a good one because change is hard and it takes a lot of time and energy to think about how to do things, how to design new things, how to show the students do things. So so I think, yeah, break it into baby steps, add a layer each time you do it uh, makes makes perfect sense. And obviously the scale thing with ePortfolio in particular, um, give the students very, very specific limits. Tell them I want 500 words and three images and no more. Because portfolios in particular can just go mental. People can just throw the world and its wife in there. Uh, and also, I always say, I don't want to see a picture in here unless it's relevant, you know. Uh, but I do enjoy the odd cat picture or dog picture. I, you know, they're always relevant. Um, Orla, I might just, on that point there yeah, of, of, go ahead, of, Rob. Of, 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 um, of taking things in phases and so on, I think an important thing to consider as well is involving students in the assessment process. In, in, in DCU, one of the projects we're involved in at the moment is students as partners in assessment, looking at ways that we can bring students into the assessment process as well and give them a bit of agency. And this can really help with scale if you start looking at ways students can self-assess and peer assess and provide constructive feedback and support one another in the assessment process. A, that can create some efficiencies for staff in terms of grading and management because you're getting students involved, but it's also fantastic for the learner's own agency and their own ownership of the assessment process. Um, It can help them learn, it can help them feel involved uh, and give them a voice as well. So I'd be a strong advocate for partnering with students and involving them in the assessment. I think it's good for a lot of things, including, including scale. Uh, we'll have a forthcoming resource uh, available on that in, in the next few weeks. So uh, be sure to, to keep an eye out for that on our website. Thanks, Rob. Just, and and uh, uh, Sharon, I think, may have shared a version of that, or is that an early version Sharon has shared there of the assessment? And oh, that was, one? yeah, that, that, was, that was something similar. Yes, that, that, yeah, that, yeah. that's from the EDTL project. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's another t- excellent suite. I, I, just, I, just, I just put up a link Go there. ahead, Tom. The University of Edinburgh has a wiki median um, uh, in, in residence mm. and there's some great projects coming out of what, what, what they're doing in the University of Edinburgh there. So um, I, 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 I've certainly come around to, I think, the whole idea of the co-creation wiki, uh, Wikipedia. Done actually, talk with Sharon Flynn there, done a great session that she hosted a few years ago on NUIG, shout out. Nice shout out there, Tom. Um, a Wikimedia Ireland, Sharon. I'm, I'll have to pick your brain. Were there? There's there's a lovely project I like uh, uh, go, talking about co-creation on Wikipedia called Women in Red, um, because like seventy percent of the the entries on Wikipedia are about men, um, and so to redress the balance is this great great project. So, so that's that was my uh, that's my idea is to go get the students to try and rebalance the the red. Um, uh, Suzanne, I think you want to come in and answer the question there on the Q&A. So examples of art, music, performance, composition, any examples of e-portfolios? Yeah, actually, in the in the Faculty of Education, um, uh, we have a group of users uh, who have uh, engaged with e-portfolios as part of an assessment. And they're actually on my list to contribute to our open education resource. Uh, so, um uh, what I might do is just contact them and and try and encourage them to add it in. They 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 were um uh, they were open to it, but I just need to follow up on that. So that would be an example that would go into uh, our open education resource. And just in terms of scaling as well, Orna, 
um, while I'm here. Uh, you know, one of our um, uh, assessments on the, the B.Ed. program, the Bachelor in Education program, which is 450 um, students, uh, they use a, an e-portfolio assessment. And again, in terms of scaling, like Tom mentioned already, they have a team of assessors and those assessors use uh, a combination of rubrics. But the interpretation of the rubrics is a very important piece. Uh, of that assessment process. So it is possible, but yes, needs needs some careful planning. And time and resources is, is uh, and manpower or woman power, uh, as you say. Um, Vlad, come on in. I think you have a question there. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, Rob uh, uh, raised the, the ball for me with uh, uh, the discussion about involving students in the assessment uh, process. And I wanted to, to quickly ask our uh, panelists, what was their perspective about involving students in the assessment process and also in the decision about the, the type of assessment that uh, we should use? So should, should we involve students in the process of assessing and should we ask them how they would like to be assessed? Something like this is my question, because I know that we have also students uh, here with us. Yeah, can I come in on that, um, uh, Vlad? Thanks, thanks for that question. Um, we had a at our teaching and learning day um, last year at DCU. We had a student panel who spoke about flexible assessment, and they a really important point that that has stayed with me from that student panel was that yes, they embrace uh, the. Um, the choice available when, when, you know, when choice is offered around assessment, but that too much choice, there's a balance there, that too much choice is actually overwhelming. And that, you know, a, a certain level of choice is, is very much seen as a positive by students. And I'd be really interested to hear um, a student point of view today. Uh, so I think we need to kind of consider, you know, that balance of yes, definitely offering choice, but not to get to the point of being overwhelming because it, it's just, it again, you know, it will just kind of tip that balance of uh, the flexibility offered uh, if we go too far. And on that as well, Suzanne, um, I know earlier on in the week, Sharon Flynn here coordinated a webinar with various student interns from the EDTL project who were all giving their perspective on assessment um, and uh, I'll pop the link in the chat to the recording when I can find it. But very much a lot of that was coming up uh, as Suzanne was saying, students do want choice, but, but but it needs to be, there needs to be some structure on it. They do want creative and engaging um, assessments uh, uh, because they, they enjoy that more. Um, and, and they do want maybe some kind of practical scaffolding and practical support around managing and tackling assessments and, and, and things like that. And, Anytime we speak to our student intern um, about issues around assessment, it is so illuminating to get their insights around how they're getting on and what they're finding difficult and what support they need from us. So I think the more we can talk to students and, and listen to them and take on board their advice and get them involved in processes, it's a win-win situation because it's, it's good for us and it's, it's good for them. That's very, that's inspiring there, Rob, I have to say. Uh, but I I, to I I totally agree. There was one very interesting thing there in the chat. And Karen, I think you had, you. I liked how you said a bounded choice. So, you know, yeah, a choice with some limits on it. But but I, I, I totally agree. Too much choice is, is overwhelming. Um, so it's that delicate balance. Well, there's um, nothing worse than feeling like you're out at sea. And I mean, I, yeah. I know it's, as teaching staff, I mean, we, we often... Feel, feel that quite a lot. But I mean, you know, our students know, um, you know, when choice is presented to them, it needs to be structured, it needs to be bounded, and it needs to be sensible. I mean, providing a, a choice of assessment, whether it's the type of assessment or mode of assessment, or even something like um, giving our students the opportunities to choose their own groups or to choose their deadline for submission of assessment, unless we bound that and we structure that in a reasonable way, um, it can actually become very unmanageable mm. for our students. So there, there's just small considerations that we need to do um, to ensure that while choice is offered and, and freedom and flexibility is offered it needs to be met with a little bit of structure and a little bit of organization from our end and um, mm. to ensure that we have the best outcomes for our students i, I think I, I think that that's a point that that goes 
across a lot of um, kind of trying to open up things. Sometimes it, you have to make sure that that still seems structured. It's, it's already like it's already been said, but if, if it's if it's too much, just like let's explore this together. Like pe- pe- students just feel like they're they're ad- they're adrift and they don't know what to do and they don't know. And you know maybe like you know it could back to that thing of often I think we forget what it's like to be let's say a an you know an early undergraduate you know and it's like you you seriously need to tell me what's happening here because right now I just feel like you're telling me to go figure it out myself entirely. You know they 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 need that structure absolutely. Please tell me what to do. Um, there was one uh, thing in the chat there, which I thought was very interesting from Naveen. Um, consider using ipsative uh, uh, grading. So that's comparing two things and deciding which one you th- you like you prefer. I've never um, come across that for ePortfolio, but I think it could be very interesting um, because then you have your idea of what's quality and then you compare. I, 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 does anyone want to come in about Ipsative assi- assessment or Ipsat evaluation there? Um, I or not? Up, I had to look it up. <laughs> I, I, I Googled I, I, it as well, Tom. I Googled it as well. So I, I, I actually use Wikipedia <laughs> to look it up. <laughs> Um, the, I, uh, the, on the example of the music uh, portfolio, I have an exemplar here from a student. I might show quickly. Uh, um, so from DCU. So do, the student is given permission to share this. Okay, so don't worry. I'm not breaking rules there. Um, so here's our e-portfolio platform here, Loop Reflect. And one thing um, one of our colleagues, Lisa Donaldson, does is provide a lot of exemplars of student work because obviously for both the teaching point of view, but also from the student point of view, seeing what it actually looks like really helps. So there's a nice one here. Uh, I can put this example in the chat as well from a music specialism um, and you can have a look through it. But what I like about it is, okay, there's a picture of her class, which is nice in itself. So she's learning about this particular methodology, uh, the Codeli method. And you can see, She's she's linked it to her own development. She's a video of herself using some of the methodology. She then puts it into practice in her teaching practice. And you can see she's got further evidence of that. So I think it's a lovely example of an e-portfolio, but also a lovely example of a music one. So I'm just going to share that now um, into the chat if people would like to. So we're kind of coming to the end of our session. Um, I really like to thank everyone for their contributions. You've been a hugely engaging group. I'm just going to hand over to me, partner in crime, Vlad, to to conclude. Thank you, Orna. Well, I I don't have uh, much uh, to conclude because uh, this is still a very open and uh, 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 flowing subject for me. And I think for all of us, because uh, we still don't have the exact answers and the correct answers, and we still need to, to do a lot of work. But I hope that for everyone here today, uh, a lot of uh, good examples were shown, and uh, you can uh, put them into good use and then come back to us uh, and uh, tell us how, how it went. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here uh, during this webinar. And don't forget, um, Eden is uh, still having uh, until next Monday, a lot of interesting webinars. Thank you for all panelists and uh, for all the attendees. And I wish you a very nice day. Thanks, Vlad. And I think if you're interested in attending the the next Eden session, which is on this afternoon, it's called The Next Normal, including student views at at five o'clock Central European. So the details on the Eden website.